So, my name is David Barabee, and I'll be talking a little bit about High Performance Ruby on Rails in my sequel, um, which is a nice and ridiculous long title. Um, so why don't we get right into it? Uh, first question is, who am I, and why do why do you care? Uh, why you care is a personal issue, but uh, uh, presumably because you're in interested in Ruby on Rails, and preferably having Ruby on Rails applications that respond, uh, respond at a reasonably quick speed. Uh, so the question remaining is, uh, why am I qualified to tell you that? Well. I'm a freelance software developer. I uh, worked in a, a smattering of different industries, mostly working in the entertainment industry now, doing stuff for the commercial casting industry, which is the process where they decide who, uh, which actor is going to be in a commercial, um, which sounds glamorous and exciting. Uh, it isn't glamorous and exciting, uh, except during conversations and presentations at my sequel conference, you can say things like talent agency, casting director, and actor, and actually have it mean something. Um, but other than that, it, it's... Uh, not very interesting. It does involve a lot of database stuff, uh, a lot of queries, and, and preferably making things go at a reasonable speed. Uh, so I have some experience in that area. I've also written a couple books, um, all published by APRESS, and all having the word practical in the title, uh, which isn't the coolest, but no one at APRESS takes my suggestions anymore, so what are you going to do? Um, the, la the middle one, Practical Whales plugins, I actually wrote with a guy named Nick Plant which I should have credited on my slide, but apparently I was greedy when I wrote this, so I didn't. Anyway, so uh, if you probably use some mildly familiar with Rails, but if you're not, Rails is a web development framework for developing web applications. Rails has a lot of, uh, a lot of steam right now. If you've heard of Twitter, um, which a few people are using, at least five or six, um, Twitter is written, written largely in Rails. Um, and uh, a few other uh, large applications. We use Hulu, which is uh, uh, the, the TV industry's thing where you can go on and watch uh, new television shows and have them streamed, uh, which, unlike YouTube, is actually making money, which is fairly bizarre for an uh, online video site. Uh, Wales is a, mo a model view controller, so if you use another model view controller framework like Cake Beach, it's familiar to you. Um, it encourages ra agile, rapid development. That's one of the reasons why, even though you hear people say Wales is slow, Wales is slow, people keep using it because. Uh, costs come in a lot of forms, and one of the costs is, uh, you know, obviously performance you're concerned with the cost of the hardware, but the cost of developing it is important too. And sometimes if your development takes too long, you miss your window of opportunity, and then your entire business goes bust, someone wants to be to the market, and you don't make any money at all. That's a very large cost, and that's one of the reasons why agile rapid development is important, even if it comes at a performance cost. Now, as we're going to talk about, it doesn't have to come at a huge performance cost, um, but it, it does have some cost. One of the things about Wales is that uh, Wales makes assumptions. Um, for example, if you perform a query in Wales, uh, it pulls all the fields from it. You tables by default when you do something in Wales. Uh, this is usually not a big problem. Can be somewhat of a problem, particularly if you're um, if you have a lot of blobs, large blobs mixed in with your tables. You probably shouldn't have that anyway. But in case you have uh, images stored in your uh, uh, directly in your database. Uh, that can be a huge problem. But even if you have a lot of small, say, Varchar 255s, or, or even a whole ton of Varchar 50s, it can actually cause a significant problem. Uh, I've seen instances where relatively innocuous Rails pages are pulling down a meg of data uh, per request across my SQL connection, which is you know, a fairly large amount for, say, 50 records. Um, fortunately, we can, um, we can uh, get around that, like I was saying. Um, so why? Um, I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit, but this slide talks about why is Rails slow. It makes things easy. It doesn't read your mind. So the Rails API makes assumptions about what you're going to do, uh, and then doesn't want to box you in any. Fortunately, once you've written an application, you can say, okay, well, I know I'm not doing this, so let, let's trim this down a little bit. Uh, select less fields, or, or we can do a few different things we're going to talk about next. The other reason why Ruby applications are often slow is it's a Ruby-oriented culture. Uh, what I mean by that is, is uh, we, do, we tend to, Ruby on Rails programmers tend to do a lot of things in the host language. Uh, Ruby, obviously. Well, that's nice because Ruby is a nice language. It's not the best thing because obviously people use databases for a reason, people use MySQL for a reason because it's fast. Um, and doing things in, uh, in Ruby, even though you can do it in very nice and you can do it in this uh, gorgeous interface with just a few characters, get it done, is going to take way longer than doing it properly with SQL in the first place. So, again, you have to balance what we talked about earlier, agile app development, uh, doing things the easy way, and just hammering out a, a quick dot map or dot sort by this versus doing things properly. Um, fortunately, there's tools available so you can pick your points and choose 
Where are you making your trade-offs? So, um, one of the other things that you want to bear in mind is that there's a lot of different types of, of problems. Most whale, um, we have a few categories here. Most whale sites fall on, uh, most whale sites whale sites are working on fall in the first category. They have a relatively easy database problem, but very high traffic. Um, so you want to do things like cache, cache your pages, um, that kind of optimization, because your data doesn't change that often. Um, the problem with that is that's a completely different type of thing from the, from the second category. We have a hard database problem, you're doing reporting, that sort of thing, and you have a relatively low amount of traffic. Or you have a higher data, database problem and a, and a high amount of traffic. Um, the reason, one of the reasons that's different is because you have to uh, apply completely different options. Often you talk to Wales developers, even seasoned ones, who do a lot of database development, say, well, that's easy, just cache your database objects. You say, well, I'm not trying to get a database, I'm not just retrieving records. You say, I have to, you know, I'm doing aggregate functions, and doing this, and this. And then the Wales developers are you say, oh, huh. Fortunately, uh, there are people who have done that, and there are paths you can take. Um, so, even if you fall into, uh, obviously, if you're doing something that falls in that category of, you have, uh, each, each page doesn't take long, you, uh, long to render, but you simply have a lot of them, you have a lot of queries, a lot of hits. Obviously, we also can work well in that scenario. We can also work well with a little bit more work in the scenario where you're doing di complicated database, database problems and getting answers to complicated questions, um, even, if you have, uh, even if you have lower page view. Um, the question is, uh, first of all, how are you going to find your performance issue, the issues you have? Often, we, have some, we don't necessarily know you, you can get used to feedback, you get this and you get that, but um, often you don't necessarily know what's causing the load on your server. There's a few things. Um, obviously, you, you can use tools built in, uh, built in MySQL, uh, the MySQL slow log, and, and various other things. Uh, Wales itself is a development log. Uh, if, you, if, you look, if you open up Wales in development mode, you say script server, uh, you, you hit a page, and then a little, little a bit of text scrolls down. It says, this is how long it took in the database, this is how long it took uh, rendering the text book, and so on. That's not real detailed, but you can get a lot of information that way. Um, the next thing is, uh, at the Casting Frontier, we have a tool we call um, uh, EBDB Tools. Um, yeah, I named it. I'm kind of weird. And what that does is it adds a, an Ajax pop-up to each one of your pages. that says, okay, this page had so many queries. Uh, they took so long. Then you can get a little detail drop down and say, okay, this, uh, this query looks like this. It took this, it took this long. That sort of thing. Um, what that lets you do is uh, very easily and quickly spot one of the most common oil's performance problems, which is when uh, you're not being quite careful enough, either doing e with your eager loading, and you're accidentally add doing an extra couple hundred uh, MySQL queries around trips when you don't need to be. Is that it will be next week on on GitHub. Uh, I meant to have it on by the time I get out, got up here today. Uh, I didn't, unfortunately, because I'm lazy apparently. But it will be on GitHub. Um, and uh, I'm fairly certain by the time it's up there, no other no other tool will be named EBDB tools. I could be wrong. It could be someone's work just on GitHub right now, but uh, uh, it'll be available. It's based. On, it, it's also based on other code out there. So if you type in database query counter into uh, Google, there are a few other projects out there for Rails. Um, none of them uh, are as drilled down as what we do, but uh, they, they do exist. Um, the other thing is that uh, the other problem I, get, I see a lot of is that. Uh, not all Wales performance issues have anything to do with the database. Wales also makes it easy to do a lot of other stupid things. So you want to make sure you're using tools available like Firebug and Yslow. Uh, if you haven't used it, uh, obviously I think most people have used Firebug. Um, Yslow is a tool developed by the Yahoo team, which lets you see various statistics. Okay, uh, how many external CSS files am I pulling in? How many external JavaScript files am I pulling in? How long does it take to get each component off this web page? Because often, uh, a pay, you, 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 you users can say, this is taking too long to load. You know, this is taking six seconds to load, I want to load, and your boss says, I want to load in under a second. Okay. Often you can optimize your database and hit it from this angle, start adding indexes, removing indexes, doing this and doing that, and then you load up Y slow, and you realize that it's spending five seconds rendering the page, and one second uh, on the round trip. Um, there's a lot of stuff, uh, I can't go into all of it now, there's a lot of stuff you can do on, like with jQuery. We also always love jQuery. But if, you, but if you are not careful doing your selectors, you can find that you're hitting, uh, iterating through all of the DOM objects in your entire page several thousand times. If you just do a class select in jQuery dot something, it will iterate through every DOM object on, on the entire uh, on the entire page. So you want to add a parent, you want to add a tag name, say like uh, um, hash some dip, 
some parent div, div dot, some class name. And then it's only it's going to cut that down significantly. Um, the other thing is that, is that often people say, oh, this is going slow for me. It's going slow for me tonight. Uh, and then the problem is actually that Cogent somewhere between you and them, uh, your server and them, is having some issues. And they're not telling network admin, uh, the network admin or uh, data center about it. And that's what's causing the trouble. So um, obviously this isn't always the case. But before you, you look at a database problem, you want to make sure that you've uh, eliminated all of, uh, or at least ameliorated as far as you possibly can other issues. Because frankly, users don't care how long your database is taking to respond. They really care about, uh, about um, the, the total response time. And granted, you do need to make sure your database is your database calls are reasonably efficient. You don't want to be spending a lot of money on hardware behind the scenes. You don't have to. But uh, ultimately, it's, it's the time, uh, the response time, and the snappers to the user is what they really care about. So um, earlier I talked about there being a movie-oriented culture. Um, what you want to do is instruct Rails to do things like ordering uh, on the database side rather than doing it on the, on the movie side, especially if, if, you have, if you have a, a lot of results returned. Um, this is relatively simple. Um, and if you were writing on SQL by hand, you probably never wouldn't make this mistake. But because Rails is, is so easy and because uh, the programming is so easy, it's, you see this a lot. Um, so don't sort in your, in your Ruby code. I don't know what I just did. That's not right. I don't know why that's a link. Obviously, I don't know how to make presentations. Um, don't sort in your, in your Ruby code. Sort in the database. Um, the next big problem I alluded to earlier is the eager loading problem, called the n plus one query, query, query problem. So this code right here uh, is fairly innocuous. Uh, you say um, you, you load some objects and then you iterate through them. Presumably, this would be in a view. Um, except that there's no closing each one tag for no apparent reason. Um, besides that, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious. And uh, this is going to produce a fairly large amount of queries. Again, it's not obvious. What it's going to produce is it's going to produce one query plus one query for every row in your result set. Possibly a very, very large amount of objects. It gets even worse if you, uh, if you have nested objects. Fortunately, the solution is fairly easy. Um, this is there's an include parameter. You can, you can pass the find. What, what that used to do was uh, do a join on the table, which works fairly well if you have a one-to-one -one relationship. In many cases, you have a you have a many-to-many a many -many relationship or a one-to-many relationship. It does not work as well there because you end up duplicating the amount of data that you're returning uh, across the connection a lot. Now, Rails would strip that out for you automatically in previous versions, but I think it's since Rails 2, might be since Rails, might be somewhere in the one branch. But in any event, ever since then, it will now do one separate query for each table involved. So this will do two queries, but just two queries, no matter how many results are, what results are returned. Uh, so that's going to go significantly faster, um, especially uh, if there's some latency on your MySQL connection, uh, depending on your, your architecture. Um, unfortunately, yeah, yep. So what's your trade-off then? Well, as far as object size coming over the wire, I mean, if it's well, the camper is an, an easy example, but let's say you're either loading a table with a lot of columns. Well, that's the thing you want to be careful of here. Is that you, um, if you just ego load everything every time, you're going to waste a tremendous amount of time. Uh, so what you want to do is use a tool like we talked about earlier, like EBDB tools or something similar, so that you realize when your query numbers are getting high. Now you're never going to get your queries down to just one per page. It's not going to happen. Uh, well, obviously some pages will have one, one, but in general, it's not going to happen. Um, so the, there's two separate issues here regarding the amount of data coming across the wire. The first thing is how many t tables are you ego loading? There's something called an eager loading, so it does it before it's stri strictly speaking necessary. So if you include more things than you have to, you may include things which are not necessary at all. The second issue is that um, um, is is the select issue I talked about earlier. Um, I should have I should have put an example of this. What you can add is a select parameter. You can say select ID common name, and then it doesn't matter how many other uh, fields are in your table. It'll only select those two. Um, the one thing you can't do right now, unfortunately, and you have to, uh, and there's no easy way to get around this, is you can't say um, load the post table, also load the categories, but from the categories only select these fields. What you can do is load them separately yourself and manually change your view code. That's unfortunate because it puts in your view knowledge of the way your database is running. There's nothing else you can do about it. Um, 
unfortunately. And if the database problem is bad enough, you just have, you just have to do it. Um, there are alternatives like Data Mapper. The problem is Data Mapper doesn't play that well with Rails. Data Mapper do, does solve this problem nicely, and it makes a lot of other architectural changes, which you, you may not like. I don't like, personally. Uh, the, the, the Data Mapper guys are very smart, and I respect them. I just don't agree with all the decisions. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, there, there is no magic bullet. And if the problem is bad enough, you're gonna have, it's going to be, be obvious in the view of which are true. But for most simple cases, you, you can get stuff. What you can do in that case, if you really have to select, I should, I should be brief here, if you really have to select just a few fields on something deeply nested inside of the include, is you, you do a separate statement, say something like add categories equals category.find, and then you strip out just the IDs from the previous table. On the, and then you can turn that into a hash, and then do a hash lookup in your view. Say, add categories by post ID. It's not any better than I made it sound. But uh, there isn't any other way, better way to do it right now, um, unfortunately. It is actually possible to manually um, uh, take another list of objects and, we, uh, and do manual eagle loading, but it's way worse than what I just described, and you really don't want to do it. Um, the next thing I want to talk about briefly is deep eagle loading. The thing is that sometimes you have to do, you have, uh, you, especially if you're on complex business applications, you, have, you want to eagle load an object that has a relationship and then eagle it, its object underneath that. For example, this right here um, is an example of iterating through the post and saying uh, post.author.image.publicFileName. The problem with that is, uh, is that um, the previous syntax we, we, we described wouldn't work for nested relationships. What you can do is pass a hash, like I do here. Not real pretty looking. Um, what you do? Um, because what, as soon as you make it a hash, you have to include values for all of the keys, even though you really just want to include the key. So it does look a little confusing looking. What that's saying is include uh, the category just like before, uh, nothing underneath the category, then include the author, include the image with that, and then include nothing under the image. Uh, and then you can do that arbitrarily as deep as, as you want. As before, you don't want to pull in anything you don't have to. Um, and in some cases, you might even want to allow to not eagle load if you know that there's only going to be ever be one or two uh, children of a particular object found uh, in, um, in, a, in a particular case. However, usually that won't help you much since you're only saving one or two objects throughout the life. Um, the other thing which can bite you, which is why it's important to have a tool that monitors the amount of queries, is, what is when you are doing eagle loading properly, but you're, you, have, you're, you properly dry your code up so that using partials to represent objects. The problem is if you if you have, if you load an object, um, right before I said, why don't I just describe, describe the problem first of all? But let's uh, this is fairly simple. We're finding a user, and then in the view we're iterating through all the user's posts and rendering a partial, saying let's display the post summary for that post. The, um, what this doesn't. Well, this doesn't look like it would produce any extra queries because we originally loaded the user and then we're iterating through his posts and be because we said user.post, you would think that we also would associate the, um, the, po the post with their user object. They, can't, you, they came from the user object. It doesn't do that. So what, what you actually have to do is say user.find, include posts, and then include user back underneath posts. Um, unfortunately, there's no easy way to detect whether you have that kind of thing going on, whether you're going to be referencing an object, um, referencing an object's parent uh, when you load it through there. So there's no easy way to detect that. And unfortunately, this is going to produce an extra query because it's, what it's going to do is it's going to look up the user, then look up the post, then look up the user again. Um, in some cases, that can be a problem. And again, the only way to do that is by manually changing your view code to have knowledge of your database. In most cases, this isn't going to be a huge issue because it's only going to have one extra query, which hopefully won't have that many additional results. Uh, it depends on your exact use case. You want, you want to benchmark out and find out for sure. Um, the other thing you really don't want to do that you see sometimes, uh, and if seeing as this is a MySQL conference or a Wales conference, probably most of you won't make this mistake, but you really don't want to pull a bunch of records and start doing calculations in Wales, uh, doing things like counting, uh, finding averages, that sort of thing. We want to do that in a database, especially if you have a very large number of records. Um, 
what else does provide some reasonably nice functions for doing that sort of thing? For example, um, if you pass the group function, the, uh, the group uh, option that to find, it lets you group, it translates that into a, uh, a group by uh, a group by um, clause. You can also pass a string if you want to say uh, specifically what you want to, if you want to use a, a SQL frame. You can also use the calculate function. Uh, here it's fairly obvious. It says oldest age equals person dot calculate max age. Uh, this actually will work with any fun this actually literally function uh, converts that symbol into a string and calls that function in your database. So you can actually use any of my SQL uh, group function here. You can uh, aggregate function here. And if you're running on Postgres, you can use any Postgres aggregate function. It, this calculate function is not tricky. All it does is has a SQL fragment and interpolates what you're passing into it, um, which is nice because it, 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 it's forward compatible. Um, I talk about this in more detail. How you, how you can do uh, calculations in page 20 to 32 of practical reporting with Ruby and Rails. Like I said earlier, A plus books always start with practical, pro, or beginning. We're not the most creative people, unfortunately. But, um, anyway, uh, in many cases, you, you're going to be doing more sophisticated stuff, and it's not going to work to just say, give me the, the average age of everyone on the table, give me the oldest person on the table. You want to do something like, give me the oldest age of everyone who ever purchased a Chevrolet from this dealership on this date, or whatever. You want something more complicated. In SQL, that's fairly easy. Uh, you're not, you may do that easily with Rails built-in object-oriented loading mechanism. So you're going to have to do something else. Um, good, I was afraid that wouldn't be readable. Um, what this is, is some fairly vanilla SQL. Again, this example is plucked away from my book. Um, and seeing as, as, as this is an O'Reilly conference, I'm going to uh, tell that as much as humanly possible. Um, uh, it selects the model, the average age, and the average accident count from uh, a hypothetical person's table uh, and groups it by the vehicle model. And then it says person dot defined by SQL dot age. Um, and then it, it simply spits out to the screen the model of the vehicle, the average age of, of the person driving it, and the average amount of accidents, uh, accidents in that vehicle. Um, and then there's some uh, ridiculously hypothetical, completely non-scientific results I've made up with down here. Um, what's nice about this is that um, you can just call methods on the object uh, that you created uh, in your select in your select statement, uh, even if they're not properties of your original method. So again, we, we define average age up here. Average age is not a property of persons. Average accident counts on a property of persons. But you can access it using fairly normal Rails Ruby uh, syntax as if it was, which is nice. Um, and again, well, a lot of Rails developers frown on doing the SQL fragments thing. If you want to get adequate performance, there often isn't any other choice. Um, there's a, um, again, using SQL by itself isn't going to isn't going to be enough. But it, uh, in, in, in every case. You're still going to have to do all the traditional MySQL development stuff you do. You're going to have to have indexes. You're going to have to, one, explain queries. You're going to have to look very carefully at your database design and make sure everything is same besides that. But you're going to keep it from doing a bunch of extra work that doesn't need to be done on the whale side so you're on equal footing with, uh, with uh, roll, what you would have if you're rolling your own solution. The great thing, though, is that you can do this just where it's necessary and leave the whale sugary goodness in all the other places. And at least in theory, have a, a great uh, um, agile rap, uh, ability to respond quickly and develop software quickly and deploy things quickly while still having decent performance where it's, where it's necessary. Um, talk a little, bit about a little bit about caching earlier. I'm um, not going to go into details. It's, it's, it's a complex, complex topic. Um, we also let you do counter caching, which is a one thing you want to do a ton uh, in the web development thing, where you say, I have a hat, many, many relationships uh, or one-to-many relationship, like say you have users has uh, has many posts. You want rather than doing a bunch of counts uh, count star queries on posts, what you want to do is store, or at least uh, if, if this is going to happen a lot, you want to store that in a column on the users table. Um, Rails can maintain that for you automatically. Um, you can also do that with MySQL triggers if, if that's more of your thing. But Rails can maintain that for you automatically um, by adding a uh, a, a cache parameter to the uh, belongs to statement. We really should have put that in there. Don't know why I didn't. Um, if you want something more complicated, cache foo, which I cover in my other book, Practical Wales Plugins, or more accurately, uh, my co-author covered. Um, this cache foo scares me a little bit. Um, 
lets you actually store database objects in um, a, a memcached st uh, session, and then you which will retrieve them at a later date. You can also store uh, you can also store um, page fragments in memcached, the whole nine yards, uh, and entire pages in, in memcached. Uh, if you have a situation where you're doing a lot of work over and over again, and you can uh, isolate it and pull it out, that works great. Uh, it works fast. It's faster than, in many cases than, um, um, and in virtually every case, uh, than just recalculating it. Um, it was saves all the database server the whole nine yards. Um, and if you're doing something like a big public customer facing homepage that's not custom made for each person, that can work great. Um, obviously, this isn't going to save any time on something that hasn't been done before. Um, it's not going to save you any time on uh, large complex queries, that sort of thing. Um, the, the other thing you, you might want to do, just like you might want to do anywhere else in MySQL, is you can't cache functions in MySQL. Uh, and if you're doing a large complex business application, that can end up being a wobble. Uh, we have that one in that lot of the casting frontier. There's two main ways to approach that. One thing you do is you use Rails built-in triggers. It has callbacks, like before save and after save. Let's say before, every time this object gets saved, uh, count the number, you know, store in, the, in this special column the, the result of the, um, uh, the MD5 sum of this guy's name. Or the, and then you can index that column in MySQL the, the traditional way. You can do the exact same thing with, uh, with triggers in MySQL. Uh, the advantage there is, uh, is you can get it. Uh, the advantage there is that the result of that is indexed. If you just do select star from some, some table where uh, uh, MD5 name equals some string, it's going to have to do a full table scan on the entire table, calculate the results for each one, and compare them. Whereas if you uh, uh, create an index with one of those two methods, you can end up shaving a lot of time off it. Uh, not only because it doesn't have to call the same function over and over again on the values, but also because it can uh, use the index to speed it up significantly. Um, oh, the other thing is, well, well, callback mechanisms don't have to just be used for, faction, for uh, function caching. You can do all sorts of arbitrary things. You can say uh, things like cache things like uh, the result of queries, like how many posts has this person made in the, la in the last um, last 30 minutes, whatever, um, or uh, how many. Uh, you might want to use, do something that is a counter cache, but maybe a little more complex. Like what we do is say, how many, okay, they have these many posts, but how many are in this certain category? How many were recommended for best of category? And store that in a, in a table, which lets you create like a summary page and do it very, very quickly. You might have to do, uh, you might have to make, uh, pull, pull a whole bunch of tables to do that otherwise. And by doing that kind of caching with, with a, by caching results of SQL statements rather than just functions, you can pull, uh, you save a whole lot of time off, something that might take a very long time otherwise. Um, but it is something, incidentally, EBDB tools also provides you with. That's the other thing it does. It gives you a cache into function, where you say, cache into this field the result of this function. And every time they get saved, it, it puts in the result of that field the result of that function. Um, loading, loading it yourself is a little more complicated, but it lets you more closely control when it gets recalculated. So you can say, if this is dirty, if it's changed, then save it. Otherwise, don't bother doing the effort. Uh, either way, uh, by putting that effort forth, you can get uh, a much faster result uh, and, and either get quicker response time for your users or else alternatively um, uh, save on hardware and, and serve more page views and, uh, uh, and the same amount of money. The other thing is that Rails is not a jack of all trades, uh, and neither is my SQL that. So you want to use, where appropriate, other tools. Um, there's a the, the gentleman uh, uh, who's running the Sphinx, uh, the Sphinx booth you may have talked to. Uh, he gets a lot of press these days. We're using Sphinx at the casting frontier. Uh, Memcached obviously gets a lot of gets a lot of press. Um, the other thing we that people do a lot is uh, if you do, if you're doing something like sorting a table, you don't necessarily have to make a whole server round trip to doing that. Uh, if you're doing something like counting, like uh, have a little counter, how many actions once before, you don't have to do that make a round trip to the server. If you apply a little JavaScript, uh, a little jQuery, prototype, move tools, whatever, whatever, whatever your thing is, you can often uh, save a whole bunch of effort um, and uh, save some queries, save some time to validate the virtual session, uh, save some bandwidth all nine yards. Um, um, so when you can, if you can look at other, other alternatives, you can end up saving a whole ton of time uh, and, and 
end up uh, getting some more, often more functionality uh, in the process. So, um, looks like I'm ending about 15 minutes early. Um, bad day. Anybody have any questions? That's, that, that's an excellent question. It, it depends on exactly what you're looking for. At the Cassidy Frontier, we use a company called Softlayer, um, which we, we love. Uh, they're they're a, a higher end dedicated server provider. They only sell entire dedicated server blocks. Uh, they don't sell VPSs and they don't sell uh, shared hosting. In the PHP world, you can do the shared hosting thing very easily. It's very well done. A lot of people know how to do it very well. In the Wales world, almost no one knows how to do shared hosting very well. Um, I've never seen a solution, and, and, I, and I don't do as much of it as I used to, but I used to do a lot of deployment consulting, and I used to do a lot of consulting for various people that had uh, Wales apps that come in and fix problems, that sort of thing. And I never saw a shared host solution that I thought worked really well. Um, the VPS thing can work pretty well. Um, people seem to really like, uh, uh, I, I use known host when I, when I use VPS, I've been very happy with um, the slice host is a lot of people use. Uh, TextDrive does it too. A lot of people swear by TextDrive. A lot of people swear by Linode. Um, I really like known host uh, for VPSs. Um, I would strongly recommend against the shared host if you can avoid it. Um, any way humanly possible. Shared hosts work great for PHP applications. I've hosted a ton of PHP applications over the years on uh, shared hosts. Usually they work very, very well. Uh, hosting those applications on shared hosts are just a complete nightmare. And it's the opposite of what you should be getting. The great thing about a shared host of PHP is that somebody else worries about keeping a patch going and somebody else worries about where your application is located. You have the exact opposite problem with shared hosts on Wales. You have to worry, okay, uh, yeah, you, you guys don't have an updated version of image manager. Why don't you have this gem installed? Why don't you have this installed? You know what I'm saying? My Wales application died for no apparent reason. Can you please restart it? You want one of these things all the time in shared hosts, and it's just not good. Um, so if you can get either a VPS or a full dedicated box, um, a lot of people claim that VPS give you more bang for your buck. That hasn't been my experience. I found that if you go with a dedicated host, you can typically get a better, a better uh, deal for your dollar. But you have to sys have in the whole thing yourself. Your responsibility goes down. Um, the upgrade path is harder. You see, uh, you know, VPS, you can just flip the switch and boom, boom, you got an extra 125 megs around. I'm sorry, known. The, yeah, I have the uh, thick New England accent. That's what I'm blaming on. Um, um, yeah, so known host and software, but again, slice host, uh, Linode, um, those are all very highly recommended. The other people is the other people that do it really well is, is pretty much the um, uh, the the uh, the very top layer of, of the Wales Consulting for deployment is uh, Engine Yard. The Engine Yard guys, um, yeah, uh, um, it's not. Yeah, they obviously know what they're doing in terms of their pricing model. I, it's not, you know, I, I, I'm a little more comfortable with the this is how much hardware you get, this is how much you pay a month thing. I'm not sure I completely understand where they're going with that, um, but obviously their credentials speak for themselves. You know, when the when the engine guard guys talk about performance, you know, everybody listens, myself included. Um, and uh, if you if you have to bring in someone uh, to consult, you know, obviously those guys are all. all um, but the other, the other thing is you want to think very carefully about your exact requirements. Um, you know, uh, for example, at the Casting Frontier, we, we, uh, we do a lot of video stuff because we're, one of the things we do is we, we when, uh, have auditions that get taped and get uploaded to the internet um, through our system. And what, we had, what that means is during the day, we have an, uh, a bizarre ratio. We have all these people all, all over the, the country with T1 shooting data at, a, at, our, at our server all the time. And a lot of times small amount of people downloading these videos. Um, so what that means is that um, you call up the network admin and you say, "Oh, uh, we're, we're having network problems." He says, "Well, I just want to download. You know, I just want to download test our server. It's fine." So no, we're not having download problems. We're having upload problems. The guy goes, "Huh?" Um, because that's not you know that's not something that you saturated on a server a whole lot. And um, that's just one type of thing you might run into. But there's a lot of stuff that can happen. Um, you know, for some people, the reliability is the most important thing. If you're a one-man shop and you want to do the, the, the social media startup thing, having somebody else that can, that can take care of it might be really, really important. Uh, on the other hand, if you're doing something and the most important thing is you get the most bang for your buck, and it's, the network quality is not the most important, you might want to go with someone like High Velocity or Layer Tech. Um, 
I've had great experience with the both of them. The network is not as good as software for dedicated hosts, but the box isn't cheaper. So you can get a whole a little army of, of, of machines. Um, your packets will get there. They won't necessarily get there as fast as you might like, um, but they are going to get there. So depending on exactly what you want to do, you, you want to work uh, with with that. Uh, and if you ever look at a web hosting stuff, go to webhostingpark.com. Uh, if you haven't already, that is the world's basically the world's center for getting uh, uh, dirt on other web hosts. Find out what kind of things that they're, they're likely to do, uh, and, and whether there's someone alive to live with. Because there's about a bazillion web hosts involved in the world, and the startup capital required to start a web hosting company is, uh, you know, 20 bucks. Uh, it's virtually nothing. You can get a reseller's account from almost anybody um, these days, and a lot of these ones are one by 15 year olds. And I don't mean that hypothetically, I mean, or uh, uh, allegorically, I mean literally. Uh, they're won by 15 year olds who have, you know, a credit card from their parents and are trying to make money on the internet. Uh, and all sorts of other fly by night operators. So I want to make sure that you check it out and you get somebody that uh, is worth dealing with. So again, that's my recommendation. A known host for VPS and software for dedicated servers. Oh, I'm sorry, that's webhostingtalk.com, three words. Um, and they're just that, that they're great. Um, I, obviously, like any community, there's this upside and the downside, but uh, uh, you, you can get experiences on almost anybody. And if you don't find anything about your web host on there, that's a really strong bad sign that something weird is going on. On the other other thing is that if you go to their special section, all major web hosts are basically wanting to do it for web hosting talk customers basically all of the time. Um, especially the dedicated uh, host providers. So you can often find double the WAM for the same money or first month free or double the hard drive or, or, or whatever floats your boat. And, and if, you can, if you can plan your deployment on for, uh, uh, for an early stage serve, they can make a big difference in terms of, in terms of your, your cash outlay. Uh, yeah, uh, yes I have. Um, I, I don't... Um, I, I am absolutely in love with the way Data Mapper loves, uh, handles eager loading. Um, I'm not in love with some of the other features of Data Mapper. Um, I, I, some of the other ORMs, I strongly disagree with them. Uh, I, I don't have to go any more specific than that because virtually every decision they made, uh, I disagree with. Um, but um, I, I, the Data Mapper guys are really great. You, you can't. It looks like with the next release of Rails, you'll be able to use. Um, Data Mapper or any other ORM, just drop it in. You can't yet. Uh, and the, and the, the Data Mapper uh, Wales project is getting steam, but my understanding is it's not uh, quite as far along as you might like yet. Um, but the, the great thing about Data Mapper, earlier we talked about the N plus one problem. What Data Mapper does is it, it has a proxy object so that when you, instead of just storing all your results in a, in a way, it stores them in a special object. So when you say uh, user.post.h, then say post.category, it doesn't just load that post category. It will load in, in uh, go and load the categories for all of the posts everywhere. Uh, and, I should not everywhere, in that same result or result set. Now obviously it's a little more overhead, it's a little more magic behind the scenes, which makes some people uncomfortable. But the great thing about that is it does the worst case, it does the best case hand tweaks whale scenario by default, which is just great. On the other hand, uh, it lacks a lot of the, the magic that people liked about active work in the first place. Um, and uh, some of its features, at least in my opinion, are fully mature yet. So, on the other hand, my co-author, who I respect tremendously and is a very, very, very smart guy, uh, loves Data Mapper, is heavily involved, and is using it for a lot of his projects. So people are doing important stuff with Data Mapper. I'm just not one of them. Uh, not a huge fan of SQL. Um, SQL is an S-E-Q-U-E-L, the Ruby ORM, not SQL as in the structured query language. But uh, some people seem to like it. So. So if there's no other questions, I think that's pretty much it. I think my time is just five minutes short, but I'll let, let you guys uh, get a respite from me, having me uh, make bad jokes and having no one laugh. So uh, that's all right, though. I think, it's, I, th I think they're funny enough for the entire rest of the audience. So what do you think? But anyway, thank you.